stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt, and we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited, 60 minutes of non-stop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Thanks, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about access television series. I'm Rodney Hood, and this is the 680th edition of Motorsports Unlimited. As many of you are aware, Ileana Motor Speedway founder and owner, Harry Molinar, passed away last year. Harry was a friend of Motorsports Unlimited, having appeared several times. We were saddened by his passing. It's never any fun losing friends. Additionally, we couldn't help but wonder what would become of his lifelong passion, the track he created and operated for more than half a century. We decided it was time to meet the new owner and see what he has in mind. In addition, later in the program, we're going to talk about Bill's recent tire testing trip to Phoenix, Arizona. First though, let's join our lovely ladies of motorsport on a cold, windy February day in Shearerville, Indiana, and learn what is to be the fate of the Ileana Motor Speedway. On this cold, blustery day in February, we may be bringing you the most important story that we're going to bring you in the year 2000, and I couldn't be really more pleased with this story, especially considering this is the start of a new century. I guess it's, people are going to argue whether it's the start of a new century or not, because it may be the finish of an old century. Whatever it is, it's a real important time, and this is a very important story, and let me start by introducing our guest, and you are? Mike McCulley. Uh, where are you from, Mike? Cheryl, Indiana. All right, it is very cold and blustery. You guys are a little nippy, right? A little yes, cold? and I'm okay. losing my feather. I know. We're going to go as quickly as we can here because this is a very important story. First of all, we are at Ileana Motor Speedway, and Luda, you know all about Ileana. Why is it called Ileana? Indiana and Illinois together. Very good. That's exactly right because Ileana Motor Speedway is very close to the Illinois-Indiana uh, border on uh, US 30. Been here for many, many years. We've been to US to I keep saying US 30 because uh, I'm thinking of the dry strip, which is now gone. But I've been to Ileana many times before, and as you all know, that this track was owned by a fellow named Harry Molinar. Ho Harry Molinar actually built this track. Chuck, if you would broaden your shot, just swing a little bit, show the audience a little taste of it. We'll get to the construction work in a second, but go ahead and show it to him right now. Uh, Harry Molinar built this track with his Harley Davidson motorcycle back, I believe, after World War II. Went out into the old fields here, went round and round and round, made a racetrack, uh, started running motorcycle races here. After several years, got into it with the AMA, got mad at them, paved the track, made it a stock car track, and has run stock cars here. This is Chicagoland's largest racetrack. It's a half mile banked, paved oval. Uh, ran stock cars here for what, about the last four decades? Yeah, just about. Just about the last four decades, very, very important facility. First of all, because it's our lar the largest track in the Chicagoland area. Secondly, of course, because it's rich in history. Now, sadly, Harry Molinar passed away last year. And, of course, this is a sad time. Harry Molinar was a wonderful guy. We all loved him dearly. And do, does anybody really know how old he was? I think 92, but I'm not sure. 87. He was 87. Was 87. Okay, he was 87 when he passed. So Harry Molinar passed away. And this track was near and dear to his heart. And we were all, in addition to the being saddened by the loss of Harry Molinar, we were all, of course, very, very concerned that we we're going to lose a facility because, of course, most of these facilities continue on because somebody really cares and really wants it. And Harry was that kind of a guy. I got word a couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, at World of Wheels, help me, Turkle. Mike, Mike, yeah, Mike Turkle. Mike Turkle, one of the competitors. He knows My you. My racers. He knows you well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and he says, no, Bill, there's nothing to worry about. He says that uh, the fellow that bought it, Mike, is a dyed in the wool or hardcore racer, and it's going to continue as a track. Am I correct? Always. Okay, now if you're keeping up and we're trying to go fast here because of the br it's cold, right, Luda? A little bit. Yeah, a little bit. It's, it really is cold. Uh, it, it, February what today? February 27th. February 27th, uh, the year 2000, so it really is cold. In any event, uh, I got the word at World of Wheels that uh, that uh, Ileana not only was going to continue, it was going to be bigger and better than ever. So I've stopped by here several times wanting to catch the new owner, introduce myself, wanted to meet him and find out for myself what's going on. Well, guess what? I did that, I think, last Wednesday, right? Right. Last Wednesday, introduced my myself. On. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, came in here, we walked around a little bit. Well, I'm going to tell you something. This is my new best friend. This is a terrific guy. You are a racer. Oh yeah, I've raced out here for years. Always did love the place. Uh, it goes all the way back to my dad racing back in the 60s. I just always loved auto racing. So your and dad was a racer also? Oh yeah, he raced at Raceway back in 64. Okay, now what kind of car did you race here? 
He ra I no, raced uh, street stock and then late models. And you did race late models? Yes. So you're aware the track is bumpy? A oh, very bumpy. Very. As a matter of fact, the last time I raced here was about 10 years ago, and it needed to be repaved then. Yes, it did. But it's not cheap to repave a half-mile no, track. Not at all. All right, one of the things that had gone on over the years, of course, is many people were pushing Harry all the time. You know, Harry, you need to repave it, you need to repave it. Of course, that's easy for the other people to say when they don't have to lay it out. The good news is, if, and if I'm giving something away, I shouldn't be giving away, you stop me. Um, you're in the construction business. Yes. Well, as I looked around at this place, I must tell you, I got very, very encouraged. First of all, Chuck, if you would, show the audience the concrete wall here and pan around as you go, as we're talking, and swing all the way down to the area that's still going up. This concrete wall apparently is going all the way around the racetrack. 3,000 feet. That is a ton of concrete. That's, that's a lot of wall. <laughs> but but that's not the end of it. After that, oh, no. you've got to put the steel poles up and the catch fencing. Right. We have uh, all the catch fences down the main straightaways. Uh, it's configured about the same way Daytona's was. So th And that's all coming? That's starting next week. And lights. And new Musco lighting system. An entirely new lighting system. Everything. Brand new. And guess what? Chuck, did you show them the wall all the way down to the other end yet? You have to tell them, no, you're still getting there. I want the audience to see that before we get ahead because that's not the end of the work that's going on here. Uh, we were talking a little bit. You're going to have a scoreboard now? Yeah, we're going to have a scoreboard on the backstretch that's coming in. Um, we also have a new quarter mile no, coming. No, wait, let's not go so fast on this. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. A score, this isn't just a scoreboard. This is one of those going to show the positions of all the cars on the track? Positions. It's a lap counter. And lap counter. And, and, and scoring. And time. Time, right. So when guys are qualifying, you'll see the... You'll see the times up on the board. That's so very cool. you don't cool. have to strain to hear them. It, but not just that. You're apparently going for this transponder system, too. Right. We're working on that right now. Okay. Where all the cars are going to have a little radio signal in them when they cross the start, so there'll be no scoring problems? or. Right. Exactly. There's a transponder that goes in the trunk of the car, and you could have 30 cars out here, and it pulls every one of the stats up instantly as this, they cross the line. This is state-of-the-art stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, folks, I, I'm sure you can tell why I'm excited about this. Now, at one moment, I was concerned, and I hope this doesn't do a disservice to Harry's memory. We loved him dearly, oh. but the fact that I'm excited about all these changes and, and the fact that the track is going to be, be staying, I, right I, I, I hope. Yes, I think he would. Yeah, I, I hope he understands my enthusiasm, you know, because he, he was such a terrific guy and such a dedicated racer, but that's not the end of it. State-of-the-art scoring with a huge, uh, something that, that people can see and hopefully the racers can see their times when they go across the line. Right. In addition to all that, Chuck, take a look at the pavement. Girls, as you can see, this is not exactly smooth. Yes. I'm wait. She fixed everything. I'm start driving and see my time. <laughs> here, here, here she was. I'm with her. You're with her. <laughs> Chuck, if you're showing the audience the pavement, apparently this is all going to be repaved too. Yes, everything's going to be ground down and completely repaved all the way around. And that's not the end of it. You're also putting another track in the infield. Chuck, broaden your shot, swing over to the infield, because guess what? You're going to put a track within a track. Right. Quarter mile will be coming. You'll be utilizing the uh, front straightaway, and it'll have an X through the center where Victory Lane presentations will take place so we can continue on to get the rest of the show going, plus have other events and divisions out here. So you can run, for example, perhaps midgets on a quarter mile track or something. Exactly. Mini, oh. mini cup cars, dwarf cars, legends. There's a lot of divisions that could come out then. Oh, that's just, that, that is so exciting. I can't tell you how exciting that is. Uh, what about, and I'm going to ask a racer's question, what about pavement in the pits? In time. In time. And one of your plans? <laughs> uh, yeah, in time. <laughs> Folks, here's the reason I asked that. What they have in the pits here, it is always very unusual, is they have pads there, paved pads, and different racers with a few more bucks than others would take and rent for the season. Right. So they'd have their own paved pads, right? Right. Well, here comes Bill Wilton Motorsports Unlimited along with our camera and gear all on little tiny wheels. You haven't lived until you've tried to drag it through the gravel from pad to pad. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> so, that's why I'm it's, asking you about it. It's bumpy back there, but we're, you know, we're going to go over with some asphalt chips, which in time packs down. We've already started putting some in, and it's packed down real well. I mean, the guys have been real ecstatic over it. In time, I mean, our, our next phase, when we get into phase two of all the improvements, we want to get to grandstands so people are comfortable. Okay, let me... Then we'll work on the back part. Chuck, I'm going to ask you to do this. I know we're going to be shooting into the sun. I want you to pan around that way. As difficult it is, do the best you can. I want to show the audience, first of all, these are the existing grandstands that are here, and I already see construction on the other side of these. Some kind of a building is being constructed there. Yeah, up uh, by turn one here, there's a block building. You'll see the walls kind of going up. That's going to be the new bathroom facility. And the reason it's where it's at is because we already have prints for the new grandstands, and that will end up being underneath the grandstands when they come in. 
Ah, so that's being built in anticipation of right. the grandstand construction. Right, planning ahead. Okay, about how many people are you going to be able to hold with the new stands? The new stands are probably around 10,000. That many? Yeah. On Just on one side? Just on one side. So you're really capable, if you wanted to, uh, you could probably build stands that would put 70,000, 80,000 people in here. You could, but I don't know where I'd park them. <laughs> well, that's true. The parking, Dad, that's the other problem. Of course, this place always had terrific parking. We've, we've got good parking. We had a couple low areas that we're working on right now, trying to get those brought back up to where, you know, people can get in and out, and uh, we're cutting aisleways out there and putting stone in them. So they have an actual, you know, know where the parking areas are, and it'll be a lot easier to get traffic flow in and out. Okay, well, again, I think the audience can probably tell why I'm excited about this. On the one hand, I was afraid we were going to lose one, and not only do I find out we're not going to lose one, we're going to have one that's just better than ever and apparently state-of-the-art. Yeah, we're going up into the new millennium. That's, silly yes, no, please, there's no such thing as a silly question except the one you don't ask. Um, you were talking about putting the asphalt chips in the pits. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you were going to make the asphalt pit chips from the old track. We're not really sure yet because this is a, if you grind this, this is an excellent base to put down before you pave again because it all kind of molds itself back together. Uh, and with all the towns and the road construction and that going on, there's not a shortage. We're, there's not a shortage. we're able to get asphalt chips pretty, pretty readily. But when in the grinding process, doesn't that create asphalt chips? Yeah, yes it does. Okay, so you had another question when we were just about to come out and do this. I don't remember what yeah, it was. Yeah, you were talking about that you heard something about the town, had a, we want to, because we want to find all, all the politics involved too. Well, I had heard just yesterday that the town uh, had some sort of clause somewhere in the law books where when Harry died, they would be able to take control or have to, they would have the right to purchase the property from his estate. Okay, let me say this. Let me jump in on this. That is about the 14th different, totally different rumor that I've heard. The rumors abound, set us all straight on everything. I can, I can give you about 40 pages of rumors. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, no, as a matter of fact, when, when I did purchase the track, I did go to the town ahead of time and sat and talked to them, and they were just elated. They just loved the idea that we were coming back in because they have their park department, the baseball fields, and to keep this going and, and put Sherville back on the map and bring it up. And so they know I'll do a state-of-the-art facility here. Well, I, I, I can it. tell them this is state What he has in mind, the stuff he's got piled around here, this is state-of-the-art. Right. And you're right, this does put Sherville on the map. It does. And it's, it's going to bring a lot of revenue in for the town. And uh, as far as a clause in there, there's nothing ever been in any law books to where some, uh, an individual can take over a piece of property like that. Okay, and I know you guys... We're not uh, talking individual, we're, we were talking government. Yeah, <laughs> right, but, but, but again, we want to put all the rumors to rest. Right. Uh, Ileana is more than just alive and well. It's going to be better than it's ever been, it's and hopefully it's going to be a tribute to Harry Molinar's memory. It's here to stay. I, I think Harry would be very happy with what he sees, you know, going on. We're preserving what he built here how many years ago. And taking it to another level. And taking it to another level. Any thoughts to some kind of a, now you know that he was running an event after his wife passed away, uh, the uh, Signe uh, Molinar uh, uh, Memorial every year. Right. Any thought to perhaps doing uh, Harry and Sydney? July 29th, the Molinar Memorial. We'll have it's the, already uh, done deal. It's already done deal. The uh, oh, Indiana great. Candle I'm Series will be here to, to head it off. We'll have fireworks. I mean, it's it's. And what's that day? July 29th. July 29th, and that's going to be an annual event? Yes, every year. Ah, that's great. I'm delighted yeah. to hear that. Now, one more thing we want to touch on, and then we're going to let you go, because I know that you've got important things to take care of today, and I want to thank you for mm -hmm. sharing a little bit with our audience. Um, divisions, what are going to be, first of all, your regular race night is still Saturday night, I presume? Still Saturday night. We are starting at 7 o'clock now, so we can get the show rolling a little faster. Uh, um, starting the races or <clears> starting qualifying? Starting the races at 7. Races at 7, qualifying at when? Uh, qualifying will be at 6. Qualifying at 6, races at 7. What are your regular divisions on a weekly basis? Our late models, our mid-America sportsmen, and super street stocks. Mid-American sportsman, you know what he's talking about, Luda? No, I don't think Yes, I do. you do. You just no. sat in one last week out in McHenry, Illinois. You sat in the Lake Geneva sportsman car, which was also a legal mid-America stock car. Ah, I, just, I remember it. Yeah, okay. So they're gonna have, that's going to be your middle class. Right. And what is the other one you mentioned? We have the late models and then the uh, super street stocks. So the sh you have a street stock division also? Right. Okay, how about special programming? It used to be. Now, I don't know if this happens anymore, and again, I'm, you know, 56 years old, so I'm calling back a long time. You used to have a thing here, a Tony Bettenhausen Classic? That will be October 14th. You're going to continue that? The, the Bettenhausen will continue. And what race cars will we bring in for that? That's all late models. That's all late model all show, late strictly models. late models. Straight, strictly late models. Okay, it doesn't sound like you've crafted anything in there yet for the sh for the short track in the middle. It's coming. We have... Um, is that going to be a different day or same nights, or do you not know yet? Right right now, we're going to have a few shows that are going to run the quarter mile along with our regular program, kind of on and off. 
Uh, we'll probably announce first of the year that we're going to be doing a Wednesday night show. We're not sure exactly what's going to go on there yet. but it'll So be you a, have thoughts of an expanded schedule? Oh, yes, very much so. Folks, you know how I feel about this. Last week's program, we talked extensively. Lake Geneva Raceway, over the years, I have watched every motorsport facility in the Chicagoland area in the Midwest, every motorsport facility continually reducing their programs. The Raceway Park, for example, used to run five nights a week, then four, then three, then two, down to one and all that. And finally, like Santa Fe Speedway, the places just close up. Last week, Lake Geneva uh, Raceway announced that they are going to expand one night, that they always ran Saturdays. They're also going to run Fridays this year. I was delighted. First time I've heard of a local short track expanding their schedule. That pleases me. And now apparently second time. It'll be second, and what we're wanting to bring in on Wednesday night is an inexpensive uh, division of racing, so the guys can get into grassroots racing, get in and learn how to drive, and you know, an, an you inexpensive. You mean for, for like Luda, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, why not? Powder, yeah. powder Puff Series. Powder Puff Series. How do you think? That'd be great. Yeah, bring the lovely love ladies it. of motorsports down here, and we'll, we'll do all the race I'd with love them. Love it. We'll get a race going between all of them. Wouldn't that be cool? I'd, I'd love it. Oh, I think it'd be the great. Fans would love I it. I really love it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we don't have all of those things kind of pinned down yet, but apparently those are the plans. Right. We, we do have some other divisions that will be racing on Saturday nights. Uh, along with it, we do have the um, the dwarf, the Badger Dwarf cars coming out one night. They'll run the quarter. Um, the Arts and Cars division, the cars will probably end up running, or yeah, the cars will end up running a qu uh, quarter mile that, eve that night. Uh, the Mini Cup series will be out. The uh, Alice and Legacies will be running a quarter mile. Let me interrupt you for one moment, Chuck. While we're chatting here, one more time for the audience, please slow camera shot on there. Show the, all the construction going on as we speak. It's February 28th or 9th. What was it? 27th. <laughs> it's February 27th. It's cold, cold, windy here. And go ahead and continue. The Allison sure, cars. I, know if I was having a demolition derby. I said not yet. <laughs> well, uh, that'll probably be a coming. Even though it pains, and I, I don't know how to explain this to the audience. It pains hardcore racers like us to do demolition derbies because it's just silly entertainment. However, you. Crowd cannot, pleasers. You cannot ignore the fact that the people love it. You wreck it, they they come. <laughs> the, the, the people love the devil, so, you, so you're probably going to be doing some in, of that. In time we will. I'd, I'd like to get the asphalt to cure up for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's something I don't want to have to redo every year. Well, one advantage that we've got here, of course, is that uh, you apparently have a construction company or had one, because i got news for you, my friend. This is going to be more than full-time. This, this is full-time plus some. Yeah, that sure is. It varies. I put everything else on hold right now. So, but you had a construction company, yes. and that puts you kind of in an advantage for getting this stuff all done. Although I got news for you, pouring that concrete, even if you own the construction company, you still got to pay for that. That's expensive. That's a, there's a lot of subs involved out here, and that's the thing. Being in the business all these years, I've learned you know who who to deal with and who not to deal with. And I'll tell you, a lot of my subs are just a one out here. Well, I'm sure that's and, a big advantage you have knowing the oh business. Oh yeah, and dedicated racers. Ooh. And anything else? That, yeah, as a matter of fact, let's not let's not forget that. What kind of support? Have you getting support from the racers? Support has been excellent. I've had more and more phone calls that the guys are, hey, I get off at 2 o'clock. If you need something, wow. I, we don't care if it's picking up garbage or painting the walls or anything you want us to do, just call me. We'll be there. Well, I'm going to tell you something, folks. Uh, I am so uh, I can't tell you how pleased I've been this week. I am absolutely delighted, Mike. I certainly wish you the best of luck. Is there anything else you'd like to tell our audience before we go? Because the girls are about to have icicles They're coming about out their to ears. Freeze to death. <laughs> uh, we'll see you on Saturday night. Absolutely. And uh, folks, I want to remind you, we're in Sherville, Indiana. This is US 30, and it's the same US 30 that US 30 drag strip used to be. And if you want to see the remnants, you just drive down US 30, go east on US 30, go a little bit past the highway. Used to be a Sunoco station. You turned that. It's not. It's not Sunoco anymore. It's not Sunoco, but it's still there. Yeah, well, what's the station the now? The track's even still there. Yeah, I, I, pieces of the track, little yeah. remnants are still there. The whole track, the right. track itself still there, but everything around it's gone. The tower's gone it, and all. Yeah, the weeds are growing over it already. But that's not going to happen to Ileana Motor Speedway. It's not happening here. We're here to stay. Folks, good news from Indiana. That sure is good news, and we were all pleased as we left to return to Chicago. Join us for the trip. We are leaving Ileana Motor Speedway now. Luda, this is the first time for you to hear, right? You have to lean forward now to get on the mic, please. Here, where? In this place? Yeah, you've never been to a race here? No. no. Mary Beth, have you been here? I've never been here, only driven by it. And Liz, I know you haven't. No, I haven't been here. Okay, uh, again, this is a really a famous old track, and I already told the story of how it was created by Harry Molinar and how Harry Molinar has now passed away. And, of course, uh, I, I think, in fact, I'm confident now that we don't have to fear whether Ileana is going to be uh, gone or not. Uh, I think uh, Mike really has some big plans, and he apparently has the ability to see them through because as we go through this parking lot, uh, this parking area as we're leaving, I mean, there is construction stuff everywhere and piles of stuff 
everywhere, including uh, uh, fill and uh, asphalt, uh, crumpled asphalt, uh, all the stuff that makes it look like uh, things are under construction. Uh, I feel pretty good about this. And Luda, you were saying that you're real happy for him. I'm very happy for him, very happy for me. Maybe after six months I'm driving. Luda, what, what kind of car do you want to drive? Everyone. Everyone? <laughs> okay. Uh, I think maybe you want to start with street stocks? Uh, you remember this is guy, he gave me Corvette, what is kind of this car? Okay, this is going to get complicated. Mary Beth, you're going to have to help me with this. What happened last year, we had Luda with her car um, drag racing up at Great Lakes Dragway. And I might point out that Luda, you lost every race. <coughs> I'm not last every race. I'm first in every race because Bill did this in purpose because he uh, try show everybody what need doing for right for practice for understand everything. You take uh, not correctly your time and need fix it this and need fix it this. But I know I'm first. Luda, you lost every race. No! <laughs> okay, in any event, what we were doing, if uh, for those that didn't see the show, is Luda had her uh, personal car at the drag strip and, and uh, the other girl was uh, Michelle, right? Michelle? Michelle had her car and we had them drag and we were trying to teach them about the breakout and about how you have to dial in your time and all that sort of thing. Uh, all Luda knows is that uh, she got to the finish line first and you don't know why you weren't the winner, right? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone knows that Luda wants to drive all the time. So when we were doing Chevy Vet Fest, right, Luda? We were doing Chevy Vet Fest. Uh, a guy comes up to us because Luda complained that the car that she was driving, of course, is a little four cylinder Ford Tempo, and she wanted to drive a faster car. So when we were at Chevy Vet Fest, a fellow came up to us, gave us his card, and he says, The next time that uh, you guys go to the drag strip, uh, she can drive my Corvette. And you're all excited about it, right? Yes, now I have car. Now I need sponsor and maybe I'm a very good driver. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing at a time. First we have another problem because now, Mary Beth, how do we explain to Luda that the, uh, I uh, the um, Ileana Motor Speedway is not exactly like Great Lakes Dragway? Luda, it's not a straight line. <laughs> yeah, this is going around. You think you know, I'm afraid to go around? I don't think so. <laughs> Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so that you're afraid to go around, Luda, but you're going to be going around with other cars. Oh, yes. Wheel to wheel, Luda. <laughs> yes, I know. I don't... This is not fun. I'm driving just myself. <laughs> so you're ready for this? <laughs> yes. Okay, I'm, we're having fun now because Luda does get excited about the possibility of, uh, of uh, driving on these racetracks. And this is really kind of interesting to me because according to Luda, and i got to take her word for it, uh, she's uh, certainly an expert being from Siberia, which is part of Russia, uh, that they don't have any of these tracks in Russia. You don't have any of this. No, I see too many tracks and bikes, motorcycles. I don't remember cars. No car tracks? Okay, so she is really looking forward to trying with it. This is something that she really does like. Now, we want to talk about something else on the way back here. We are on uh, US 30, by the way, and we're headed, uh, we're headed west uh, back towards Chicago, uh, <laughs> feeling really good about the whole idea that we're not going to lose. Well, we're all feeling good, but Liz, you're not feeling good. <laughs> no, I've been sick for a week now, so. <laughs> she's, been, she's been sick for a week, but she's doing uh, uh, a real tough, uh, I can take it duty here today. <laughs> she's, she's with us, but I didn't have the heart to put her out in that cold wind today. Um, but anyway, we're feeling real good about, uh, about uh, what we just found out at, uh, at Ileana. But I want to talk for, uh, for a little bit about what I learned out in Phoenix. I went to Phoenix, Arizona about a week and a half ago, as I mentioned on last week's program, uh, to participate in some tire testing uh, with the Bridgestone Firestone folks because of our connection with Bridgestone Firestone. And it gave me a, just a wonderful opportunity to uh, witness and explore some new technology, some things that I've heard about before. And I, I really did learn a lot out there. First of all, Phoenix is a really beautiful area. It really is nice. Um, but the thing that I found most exciting, and one of the main reasons I went out there, and I hope they're not watching, but I got to thrash a brand new C5 Corvette. Uh, just a great car. And actually, I picked a bright chrome yellow, a Pennzoil yellow. Gorgeous car. Just had a great time slamming it around. And by the way, that C5 Corvette is a great car. It is fast. It rides nice. It handles beautifully. It's a terrific car. 
but that wasn't the only one that I got to thrash. I also got to thrash a high performance Camaro. Uh, these things were all set up. What they did was they took all parts of Firebird Raceway out in Arizona. They took pieces of it, pieces of the parking lot and set up cones uh, uh, to give you a sort of a slalom course and then they took pieces of the racetrack and set up cones on the racetrack. So they used a whole bunch of areas and there was a whole number of us from all over the country uh, from the media that were out there to take a look at this technology. Uh, and they broke us up into four group, four or five groups I've forgotten now. And so the group that I was with would go and do the uh, um, the uh, Camaros and demonstrate what they were trying to demonstrate there. Then we'd get onto a tram and we'd move on to the C5 Corvettes and we'd spend our 20, 30 minutes there, whatever it was. And the next group had moved on to the next thing and so on and so forth. So in addition to the Camaros and the C5 Corvette, I also got to thrash some uh, some uh, Mustangs uh, on a watered down course, which in fact, other than the C5 Corvette, all of the other courses, the Camaros, no, not all of them, the Camaros and the Mustangs, these were on watered down courses, um, mainly because they don't want a bunch of uh, old, overweight media types rolling these cars over. They didn't say that, but that was my observation uh, of what was going on. Uh, did you guys have a question back there? No, we don't have questions. It's just very hot. I so, don't know why. It's February 27. <laughs> you weren't very hot 20 minutes ago. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. In any event, um, so we had an opportunity to uh, to thrash these Camaros, and we also had an opportunity to thrash some minivans. And I say that sort of tongue in cheek. They were trying to demonstrate something else. That was sort of for the soccer moms, and all the soccer moms, of course, have minivans, so we used minivans. Uh, and that was for a different thing they were demonstrating. And I just want to talk for a, a, a couple minutes about some of the things that I thought was most important. First of all, the one thing that really interested me a lot. I've heard about this run flat technology, uh, and I didn't know how it worked. We're all familiar. I think all race fans are familiar with the NASCAR uh, circuit, the Winston Cup cars, and we know that those cars have an inner liner inside of the tire. In other words, they have like a tire inside the tire with very high pressure in it, but that's not really what the car rides on. The car rides on the main tire, and if they should have a flat, they call it uh, equalization, but if they should have a flat, uh, what happens is the car drops down onto that inner liner, the driver knows it right away, gets off the racetrack, and it's better than, you know, having a complete flat and going into, into the wall. But I was wondering if this run flat technology we've been hearing about from a few manufacturers, uh, I was wondering if that worked the same way if it was an inner liner in a tire. Well, as it turns out, it's not. First of all, I can tell you this, and this was what they demonstrated on this, the C5 Corvette. Now, I'll first tell you how it was demonstrated, and then I'll tell you how it works, because that's what I was real interested in. Uh, what they did was we went out on the C5 Corvette and took several laps, and run it hard, you know, run it real hard, as hard as you want to run it. Uh, and it was a delightful car to run fast and everything, and of course it handles beautifully and it's fast and all that sort of thing. Uh, then you come into the pits and they take the right front valve core out of the right front tire. In other words, no air, no possibility of any air in that tire. Uh, then you go back out onto the racetrack and you run several more laps as hard as you want to. Now Mary Beth, do you think you would notice the air being missing from that right front? <laughs> I sure think it would. You would, because otherwise why do you need air? Exactly. Right, well, <laughs> what? Well, pardon me? For what here? Yeah, for what you need here. Well, interestingly enough, you can tell. Now, here's it. Now, this course that we had set up was cones and everything, and so you're going right, left, right, left, right, left. On the straightaway, you cannot tell that there wasn't any air in the right front tire. On the straightaway, you could not tell. There was, there was no pulling, though. No, absolutely no pulling whatsoever. There was no way to tell that there was no air in the right front tire. On a left turn, I'm sorry, on a right turn, because it was a right front tire, you could not tell that there wasn't any air in the right front tire. But on a left turn, you could feel it rolling over like it was rolling over. As a matter of fact, when I felt it, I started pushing the car extra hard because I wanted to see if I could roll the tire off the beat, you know, roll it off the rim. And you couldn't, and I pushed it real, real hard. But I could definitely tell the right front didn't have air in it. So there was no wheel damage? You didn't ride on the rim at all? Not only wasn't there any wheel damage, because I immediately, then when I got in the pits, I jumped out of the car, ran around to the right front, and I wanted to see if I'd scrubbed off any of the lettering off the tires. And it doesn't go that far. It doesn't roll over that far. It, it, there was no damage to the tire at all. That's amazing. Right. But you do know that it's flat. Now, the question is, how do they do it? You know, that was the interesting part about it. I, was, I had heard about this run flat technology. I want to know, okay, you know, how do you do it? Well, first of all, I should say there is one little piece of information that's important here is that in order for you to have these run flat tires you have to have a car that is equipped with a now this is going to be a little hard to explain a sensor in all four of the wheels 
and an indicator on the dashboard. And the reason for this is this indicator will indicate if you have a flat tire. Because the danger here is, let's say you're going down the highway at 80 miles an hour and you have a flat, let's say on the left front, you have a flat, you don't know it because you're going straight on the highway. Now you make an 80 mile an hour get off onto an exit ramp and your left front tire is flat, you're liable to have an accident because then you would become aware of it and you don't have as much, you know, sideways bite as you would have. So you need some kind of an indicator since you can't tell when you're rolling in a straight line with these tires, you can't tell. So you need some kind of an indicator telling you that you have a flat tire so you can pay attention. As a matter of fact, I got to I've got to get a hold of the, my friends, uh, you know, Cooch and that over at JC Whitney because they're the largest uh, 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 seller of, uh, you know, aftermarket stuff because as I understand it, these devices, these uh, little senders, apparently it's a little radio transmitter that goes into the valve stem of each tire and then the uh, a radio receiver on the dashboard. And as I understand it, you can get a tire pressure reading of all four tires all the time as you're driving, which is actually a pretty cool little device and they're supposed to be less than a couple hundred dollars. I don't know any of this for sure, folks, because I haven't found out, but this is what they were telling me out there because my question was, well, you know, how many cars have this kind of a sensor system in it other than the C5 Corvette? And they say it is available as aftermarket some companies have it I just don't know and I don't know for sure but anyhow interesting device to me that that's pretty interesting now the question is how do they do it then how do they have a uh, and Chuck are you getting tired there poor Chuck is no, no, you you very interested in talking about views I'm looking poor Chucky <laughs> poor Chuck our cameraman up here in the corner of the van he's absolutely squeezed up into the corner and I, I, I'll tell you what we've got something we're gonna put in here in a second Chuck just let me finish this up and we'll give you a little break here in a second poor Chuck is about to die here uh, in any event and by the way we're still on route 30 uh, headed west back to Chicago uh, in any event uh, here's how they do it these this run flat technology is only available on these very very low profile tires you know the kind like they have on a C5 Corvette where, yeah. where there's almost no sidewall. Most sports cars have the real low profile. Type. Right, with the big 18-inch wheels? Yes. Yeah, that's and very little tire. So what they do is they really strengthen. Now, I don't know how, and they wouldn't, I don't say they wouldn't say, they didn't say how they strengthen the sidewalls, but the sidewalls are considerably heavier on the, uh, and wider on these tires, uh, and that's what supports, actually supports the cars. The sidewall will support the car, uh, and it works, like I say, remarkably well. Now, obviously, this wouldn't work on regular tires because there would be way too much tire flopping over, but on those very high performance, low profile tires, and I think that's what kind of inspired this run flat technology. So it works really very, very well, at least my experience with it, it works It works very, very well. I'm not the kind of guy that's terrified of getting a flat tire and changing a tire, but I don't think you like it, Mary Beth. Oh, I don't mind it at all. Luda, you like change tire? For, for what I'm change tire? I'll go to this is what company? Firestone buy wheels and that's it. <laughs> no, well, there are there are there are other companies. This is a new technology. It's an emerging technology. Now the question is, Mary Beth, like all engineering, there's no freebies. What's the downside on this? Oh, they must cost a lot of money. No, I'm talking about a technical downside. I can't think of one right now, Bill. Go ahead, Liz. Tell her. <laughs> um, I know, but you know, I'll let Bill answer that one. <laughs> she has same idea in mind. Why need to worry about money? Why need to worry about change wheels? If now have this is very nice wheels, just go to this company oh, and know, buy. It. That's I know it. What it is. I know what it is, Bill. They're heavy. Bingo. Exactly. The, these because of the heavy sidewalls, these are heavier tires now, and that does bother me from a technical standpoint. Uh oh, we're getting a blinking already. No? Okay, Chuck is dying. He's just dying. We've got to give Chuck a little break here. The downside is, yes, the tires are heavier, and of course, that is unsprung weight. I didn't feel it, of course, but it would bother me technically in my mind. In any event, real quick, we've got to give Chuck a break here. He's starting to die in the corner of the van, and and uh, we've got something else I shot out there. While we're out there, uh, Robbie Buell uh, happened to be on hand. Robbie Buell, of course, is the IRL, the IndyCar driver, and he won the first uh, IndyCar race of the year in 2000, and he had just come fresh off that victory and I used the opportunity to talk to him a little bit about the IRL cart thing and about the upcoming Indianapolis 500 and I think you're going to find this of interest and matter of fact rather than me trying to explain it before Chuck dies on us over here uh, we'll let one of the girls introduce it with an insert don't go away we're coming right back because I got a lot more to tell you about the trip to Phoenix very interesting I don't need a flat tire now let's hear from IndyCar driver Rebbe Buell I have with me the winner of the first IRL race of the 2000 season, Robbie Buell. First of all, welcome to Motorsports Unlimited, Robbie. Thanks. Great to be here. Okay. Let's wait to get to the tough <laughs> stuff right off the bat. Okay. Uh, the big excitement now, and this may not be from your perspective because you're very inside, but from the outsider's perspective, the big excitement going on in the IRL this year uh, is Ellinger Jr.'s return. Uh, first question. Mm -hmm. 
How is he? You had to run against him now. Very tough. Best races behind him. Evaluate, please. Well, uh, you know, come come race day, come Sunday, I still think, you know, there's nobody better than Alan Sir Jr., and I think that will be showing this year. But that doesn't mean that uh, it's going to be easy. I mean, there's, you know, there's 26 other guys that want to win out there as bad as he does. How do you guys perceive this with him coming back in? Do you feel a little intimidated by it because of all, you know, everybody talks Unzer Andretti, yeah. Unzer Andretti, Unzer Andretti, are the IRL guys for real and all that. He came back in, didn't exactly mow down the field, moved up about halfway through the field by the halfway point and then dropped out. How do you guys feel about it? No, I, I think we're all excited to have Junior running there. You know, I spent, uh, you know, seven, eight years running in carts, so I know Al and I've run with him in the past. Um, but no, he's going to be competitive, uh, and there's going to be a lot of other guys. But uh, no, we embrace it, you know, Al being there and, and the competition. I think it's only good for the IRL. Uh, right now, the IRL's announced a new series sponsor, Northern Light. We're running new chassis this year. They have the new 3.5 motors with the, the different cranks. They sound uh, a bunch. I think they just sound a lot better than they did in years past. So I think the series has really come along. Let's take it a step further. The IRL cars are technically completely different than the kart cars. You have yeah. run both. Talk a little bit about the di I think it will be terribly difficult for Alan Jr. and Michael Andretti to come into the series and be competitive because they haven't spent time developing these cars. Perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe they're more similar than yeah. I think they are. I think they're very different. Well, you're, you're accomplishing the same things. I mean, yes, they are different cars, but they're still race cars. They're open wheel race cars. They're cars with wings on them. And you're trying to accomplish the same thing, the same type of balance, the same sensations. Um, so, so I do think you could, you know, you could go back and forth. And with a good team behind you and you have good communication with the team, I think you could get there very quickly in terms of accomplishing that goal of being competitive, whether you're switching back or forth. As you are aware, because of the cart IRL controversy, and the I think it's obvious now, IRL is here to stay. And yeah, I think you, it is. No, I think it is. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's a, just a terrific series. I think there's room for both series, if that's a word. Uh, um, you guys, if you disagree, please. No, I don't know. Um, I think uh, you know there's pros and cons to both series. I think with what the IRL is doing, the, the on-track product and the racing has been excellent uh, the last couple of years. Uh, I think that's only going to improve this year. And we saw that in Orlando. There was 10 cars on the lead lap uh, at the end there. And you, you, you had a fight. You had a fight. My question is that assuming the cart continues and assuming, of course, that IRL continues, is it going to be possible for somebody to come from cart and just run the Indy 500, the one race, and be competitive against the IRL regulars? Is that, do you think that's even possible? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, you know, any time... You're coming in and doing a one-off race, and whatever scenario it is, you're up against guys that have been in those cars and been in that series all, the whole year. They're the ones that have the momentum. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's probably stacked against you a little bit. Yeah, I think it's a real uphill fight to, to do something like that, and I'm a little interested. Do you have any idea? We know Alan Jr. is going to run the 8500. Yeah. I can't imagine Michael Andretti letting it go by if Unzer is back. Do you have any insight on that? Uh, I don't. I mean, you know, the, the latest that I've heard is uh, obviously Junior's running with Gallus, um, you know, and as that group gets, you know, more time working together, they're going to be more competitive, no doubt about that, come race day. Um, but really, I think the only one at this point that I've heard is Ganassi's guys are uh, going to make a full assault at running the, the 500 this year. And, you know, they're going to they're gonna do their testing and their homework ahead of time. Um, it's going to be tough, but they'll be competitive. It's going to be a very, this may be, this year may be the most in, exciting Indy 500 in a decade. Would you agree? I would agree with that. Okay, so we're looking forward to it? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And you guys aren't afraid of those guys? No, I, I think... Uh, I, I'm teasing, Robbie. You know, I, I just... But I think what it just makes is... I mean, on one hand, sure, you know, you want to be kind of guaranteed spot, but I think there's going to be close to 50 guys trying to qualify for the 500 this year. And remember, our format now is qualifying is over a two-day period. It's not over two weekends. So the excitement of those two days is going to be incredible. Hopefully, we'll be in the field and up, you know, in the front row doing everything we can and not have to worry about making it at the last minute. But I think it's going to be incredibly exciting. Well, certainly Robbie Beal was in the best position to evaluate that because let me remind you once again, he now has won the first IRL race of the 2000 series and does that, that doesn't necessarily mean an Indy win is in the bag, but it helps. It sure does. <laughs> Folks, Robbie Beal. As Bill said, this will be the most interesting Indy 500 in years. Now let's go back to the van because Bill wants to talk about minivans.
Beasts. We're back and we are still going west on uh, US 30. And uh, girls, if you would, make sure Luda is looking to the left, looking south as we go along here, okay? Mary Beth, will you take care of that, please? Sure, that's, left. South, that's south, Luda. Yeah, I'm understand correctly. If you say need to see left, I'm look right. right. No, 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 no. <laughs> very, it's very important, Luda, that you look out to the left here for a while. And I'll tell you when you can look back. Uh, what? Why are you trying to hide? Uh, well, nothing. Just make sure you, sure you don't want to miss it. It'll be on the left side over here. In any event, uh, I thought it was particularly interesting with Robbie Buell. Um, what I was uh, when we had the first IRL race, uh, Al Linzer was his return to uh, to the Indy cars or you know from cart. Uh, and what I was particularly interested in when we did that, let me roll the window up. We might be getting some wind noise here. Uh, what I was particularly interested in there is that everybody kind of expected that Al Linzer Jr., who had to start in the back because rain, qualifying was rained out and he didn't have any previous points or anything. Uh, what he uh, what was interesting is everybody kind of expected that Al Linzer Jr. would go from the back to the front in a Dale Earnhardt like last to. First First and three laps, uh, kind of a deal from when Dale Earnhardt was uh, in his prime, uh, and in fact that didn't happen. Uh, it looks like the competition in IRL, uh, as measured against the standard of uh, Allenzer Jr., is uh, apparently just as strong as, as as it is in cart. So uh, I thought that was particularly interesting, and and of course uh, Robbie Buell has the greatest respect for Allenzer Jr. and feels he can win on any given day. Um, and on the other hand, uh, apparently those guys in IRL aren't afraid of those cart guys at all. So I'm hoping a bunch of them come over for the Indy 500 this year. I think that would make a really, really fascinating Indy 500. Now, getting back to the tire test, we've got a short piece of tape here before we have to go out of this segment. We've only got a short piece, uh, sh uh, a short time left on this tape, so I don't want to talk past it. So I'll talk to what I consider the least interesting. I shouldn't say this, <laughs> but it was kind of it was sort of the least interesting uh, part because we drove minivans, and you know that's not exciting. I can see you in a minivan, Bill. Yeah, it really wasn't me. And Luda, make sure you're looking left over here now, okay? Over, no, Luda, the other way. That's right. Luda, Luda, look left. Luda, Luda, what are you? People, why uh, Bill tell me this? Uh, you need to understand. This is right side, my favorite store. This is so beautiful. Too many stuff for uh, decoration, yard and house. I give everybody direction if you want to call me, please. <laughs> What we're talking about, it's a place that has what Chuck and I refer to as lawn trash. And Luda, it's not lawn trash, is it? It's decoration. <laughs> decoration for lawns. I try to keep her eyes off it. In any event, uh, continuing on though about this, about the minivan thing, what they were trying to demonstrate there was something that's not new, but it may be usable now. If you'll remember, Mary Beth, you're a car person, so you might remember a few years ago. I'm not sure. I think it was Uniroyal, but forgive me if I'm wrong. It could, I could be wrong. They had a, a, a sealant technology. That if you run over something, uh, the sealant inside of the tire would seal up as the nail came out. Do you know what I'm talking about? I do, Bill, but I don't remember whose it was either. I, I really don't, but it, but it's something that was out before, but the problem they ended up having with it was this sealant would move in the tire. Now I'm guessing, because I don't know, uh, maybe it was because like be sitting on a hot day or something and the start, I'm going to say, will kind of ooze down inside. Maybe I'm saying it wrong. Maybe it was from heat buildup in the tires and all that. I'm certainly not an expert on it, but I know that a lot of people complained about it, that they were uh, unable to balance the tires after a while because of the movement of this goo or whatever you want to call it that's inside the tires, that's this sealant, this self-sealant. Uh, so, so this idea uh, isn't new, it's been around for some time. What is new, and that's the reason they demonstrated this stuff on the minivans, what is new here is that there's a new way of applying this sealant, some kind, and I didn't, uh, uh, again, uh, we were there just to have it demonstrated to us, we weren't, they certainly weren't giving away the secrets, but it was interesting what they have is they've got a new technology now for applying the sealant, they're calling it a, um, oh gee, I'm going to say it wrong too some kind of a spiral application process that's supposed to absolutely hold it in place and the idea here is because the question is obvious if I just went through 20-30 minutes with run flat technology demonstrating tires that you don't have to worry about getting a flat why the heck do you need a technology where the nail goes in and then comes out and seals itself well the, the answer to that is of course is that you don't put these low pro Chuck it can't be one already <sighs> Pardon me? Yes, it is. Okay. Listen, we've got to change tapes, so and we're going to come back. I thought I could get all this in this one little bite, but we'll come back, and I will finish this little explanation of why you need the two different kinds of technologies. Don't go away. We're coming right back. This will be interesting. It did occur to me that if you can run the tires flat, why do you need to worry about getting a flat? I think. Let's find out. Okay, 
we're going to go back to my mini uh, my minivan explanation here. And by the way, we've got to do something else first that we haven't done yet, and I should have done this before, and we didn't, so we're going to take care of it now. I want the girls to introduce themselves. Mary Beth, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Claypool. I'm Luda Kay. And I'm Liz Cozy. Did she actually blow the little kiss and everything? Oh, gee. Okay. In any event, uh, let me finish up on the minivan stuff because that's not as cool as the other stuff was. But the, I mean, it wasn't as cool to ride. It's, I guess it's a good idea and everything. But the idea, the reason that you, that you need the two different technologies is this run flat technology, as I explained before, only works on these extremely low profile, high performance, very wide tires so the sidewalls can support the weight of the vehicle. Uh, when you get a normal tire with a normal sidewall height uh, for the normal kind of riding comfort that you're looking for and all that, uh, the sidewalls won't support it. Or I suppose they could if they made them two inches thick, but that wouldn't exactly work uh, either. So this is more like a soccer mom tire. And like I say, that was a real good idea when they came out with it a few years ago, except they ran into the problem with the with the balance problems. And it would appear now that that problem has been solved. So f this is a technology that I, I suppose that uh, soccer moms in uh, 2000 and beyond won't have to worry about flat tires anymore. So are you saying they're going to have these low profile tires on minivans? No, no, no. You, you can't do that in minivans. Yeah. The, 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 the Oh, okay, I guess I didn't explain it well. The minivan tires were normal looking tires. They look like just normal, everyday, run-of-the-mill average tires, except they have the sealant technology inside. They don't, they're not run foot technology. Uh, these are tires that don't go flat because there's a sealant inside, and when the nails go through the tires and comes out, they self-seal themselves. They follow now? Yes. Whereas the run flat technology, the air goes out, and the, tire, the car is supported by the sidewall. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So now we get away from the minivans. There's enough of the mini minivans. No, no, no. Well, well. You need this van because you you have uh, too many children. <laughs> no, no, no. We, do, we, we don't need minivans. In any event, now let's get to the cooler stuff. I want to tell you something. The the one comparison I won't get into too much because it was uh, uh it was just it was kind of you know, obviously that's what they want to do was Firestone showing off and all that kind of stuff. And that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the uh, uh, the new technology that I saw. But I, I do want to say about driving the Camaros. This was very cool. These had the very wide, high performance tires on it on a wet down race course. And boy, I'm telling you, I cannot believe. Chuck, hold on. I'm sorry, my friend. I've got to stop here. <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. We're <laughs> we're in traffic here. I'm not sure where, where are we. We're on Route 30 heading west. What town is this? Chicago Heights. Okay, we're in Chicago Heights. I'm sorry, Chuck. It was a stoplight. I had to stop. He's ready to kill me. In any event, uh, but I want to tell you something. Uh, these tires, uh, I was amazed at how well they stick on the wet pavement. I mean, I pushed, I thrashed the car really hard, uh, and the tires really, really did stick good on wet pavement. I was surprised at that. Uh, but I, but again, I don't want to talk too much about that. But I do want to talk about the uh, about the uh, uh, Mustangs. Uh, the Mustangs. Uh, they had V6 Mustangs, and what they did uh, was they shaved the names off of all the tires, so you couldn't tell what tires you're on. They had all competing brands of tires, and then you just go out there and you run the cars. And one was marked with a P, and one was marked with a W, and I think one was marked with an R or something like that. Um, but nobody knew it was all a blind test. Nobody knew. But the cool thing about this was to just go out there and just take turns thrashing these cars. And I didn't, but several of the journalists did spin the cars and knock down, <laughs> knock down the cones, and uh, just all around had a had just a great, great time with this. And I was thinking about the one thing I was thinking about. I, I said, you know, actually, I can sort of understand the dilemma that any company has when they come out with something. Uh, they spend a lot of time developing and and uh, uh, trying to come out with something new. And the question is, you know, how do you tell people about it? How do you how do you get the word out there? How do you get the information out? And as it turned out, I think this was actually, a, you know, kind of a pretty good technique. Uh, you can to go out to Phoenix, Arizona in the middle of the winter. Uh, first of all, normally that's hard to make time for that in one schedule. But in the middle of February, when it's cold here in Chicago, to go out to uh, Arizona, uh, that's um, Luda. You do know that when you go and whisper, you're on camera. No, I don't do nothing. Yeah, okay. Uh, but in any event, uh, it's so that is pretty, pretty. It's an interesting way of of getting the word out. And I must say that there's nothing quite like going and driving the vehicles uh, to feel something. Although I will also say, it would have been better if we'd had a week because I would have liked to have taken. Um, I would have liked to have spent the day with each one of the, not the minivans, 
but, but with the but with the uh, minivans, uh, twenty minutes was more than enough for the minivans. But uh, the well, in fact, let me just tell you real quickly what they did with the minivan. What they did with the minivans is you go out, you take a few laps, and of course these are minivans, you know, so it's not exactly great laps. You just go and take a few laps of the minivans, and then you come in, and they've got a plate that you run over that's got all these spikes sticking out of it. And as it as you slowly run over it, you can actually hear it going. Psh, as each spike goes into the tire and we were about the fourth group that went through that thing so that t left for that right front tire I should say already had been punctured about 40 times by the time that uh, I took my minivan over it and uh, and then you go out and take a few more laps and there's no difference at all I mean uh, you know it's it's unremarkable which I suppose is a good thing it's supposed to be unremarkable but actually it's I think it's a I think it's a pretty good uh, a pretty good way to demonstrate technology but I would have liked to have had a full day with the c5 Corvette and Chuck where are we out on time I just Okay, I would have liked to have had a full day with that C5 Corvette. That I would have liked, and I would have liked to have had uh, a full day. The Mustang thing, that's real hard. You get, regardless of which tires are on the P car, the W car, the R car, whatever the, the numbers are, regardless of which ones are on, you really need, because, the, you know, they water the track, but the sun is out and the water is drying, so did you get this set of tires on a car track that was partially dry, or did you get... You know what I mean? Uh, it, it's hard to exactly compare. Um, and if I'd had a full day, uh, I would have spent maybe an hour, hour and a half uh, with one one of the cars, one of the sets of tires with, with the track freshly watered and then kind of dried out and got a real feel for it. Then jumping to the next one, uh, I think I would have had a better, would have been better able to sense the differences. Does this make sense? Yes, it makes sense, Bill. Okay, so that I would have liked to have had more time for. And the C5 Corvette, I just like to have driven that more. <laughs> That's all. I just just would have enjoyed that. You would have liked to have driven it home, I bet. Oh, I would have. I would have. I, lo I love open cars, and this was a nice, nice chrome yellow roadster. I really, really like the car a lot. Okay, in any event, I think anybody, anybody want to mention anything else about uh, this thing? Did, I, did this make sense? The information? That, so the thing I just want people to know, this run-fat technology actually does work, and the way it works is the sidewall actually supports the car and I wouldn't hesitate to drive 100 miles on it that way I'm sure they don't recommend it and believe me they wouldn't choose me to speak for them trust me but this is just my own impression I mean when you're going in a straight line like at highway or something and not pushing it hard around corners you don't you just don't you don't notice it's 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 flat so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't hesitate to, to drive it for a long ways that way and uh, yeah do you think that that would cause um the incorrect wear on the tread if you did drive it that oh way? no doubt about it absolutely no doubt about it because you remember the air in a tire is a structural member of that tire uh, air is actually part of the structure so there's no question about it when when you're riding on the sidewalls you are putting the entire load on the outside edges of the tires and no load on the inside edges. and obviously it's not good for the tire no, so in that sense you really wouldn't want to do that because no. you wouldn't want to have to go out and buy another tire. If you stopped and fixed it right away, you could preserve the tire. Precisely. You, obviously, the idea is you do want to stop and fix these things right away. There's no question about that. Uh, th that wasn't my... Your point uh, was that it was it that you could comfortable do it. enough that you could do it. You could do it, that you wouldn't feel stranded. Now, we're going to go now because if... We, Chuck, tell me if we've got any time left. If we've got any time... Okay, we've got a minute and a half. Good. I want to put a little footage of some of the racing action uh, from Ileana Speedway that I took a couple of three years ago, uh, and hopefully this year we'll get a chance to get out to Ileana when, and take a look at the new track and, and see how nice it looks all done. I want to wish those guys down there the best of luck. Uh, we really need that uh, facility. You see my time, what I'm driving. Yeah, and see Luda's time, what she's driving. Uh, in any event, folks, uh, so we're going to take a look at some uh, Ileana racing uh, uh, footage, and I hope you enjoyed uh, your day with us today. Very interesting day. Now let's look at Ileana Racing. The sportsman division has three people battling for the track championship, and they're all together here at the drop of the green flag, starting the sportsman feature. Up front, it's John Rastowski from Munster, Indiana, driving his number 35 Camaro, being chased by Perry Parker from Gary, Indiana, and his Grand Prix number 19X, followed by Chris Serenzoni from Merrillville, Indiana, and his white number 26 Monte Carlo. You met all these guys earlier. Now you can watch them in action. A flawed first attempt to get this feature underway has them all together up front. But remember, these guys are not just trying to win this race, they're trying to win a point champion. Harry Parker has taken a run at Rastowski. Oh, I think he made contact. The contact is Rastowski hands on. Let's look at that from another angle. Perry Parker in 19X is right underneath Rastowski, number 35. And there was contact. And contact again. That's a 115 mile per hour slide. And John Rastowski hangs on with a fine job of driving. Later in the race, we've still got Rastowski leading. And Parker breathing down his neck. Parker's taking another run at Rastowski. Oh, it's close.
close, but no contact. Oh, I spoke too soon. He nailed him again. Again, Raskowski hangs on. This is one heck of a duel between two outstanding and aggressive drivers. Neither one willing to give an inch. And all the time, Chris Cirincioni is lurking behind him, waiting to see how this battle's going to come out. He's biding his time. Meanwhile, Parker is taking another run at Raskowski. Did you see loot out there? Watch carefully. And here it is, the big late model shootout, and there's the green flag. It looks like number 17, Duke Malon from Sherville, Indiana, in his Pontiac Grand Prix, getting the jump on the field from the outside front row. But car number 41, driven by Mike McCulley, also from Sherville, isn't going to let this cutlass get passed by a Pontiac. Coming up the inside, it's car number 21, driven by the pride of Evanston, Illinois, Bobby Gash. And on the outside, it's John Nutley from Crestwood, looking for an opening. This is a first-class field of late models. Later in the race, number 41, Mike McCulley is leading with number 14, Larry Middleton Jr. from East Hazelcrest, Illinois, pursuing. And look who's coming up on the inside. It's Frank Galinsky and his number 91, and he's flying. Later in the race, Galinsky leading comfortably, and there's trouble in turn two, and many fast cars are involved. Look at them all, including Chicago's own Mike White. When the race resumed, Frank Galinsky put some distance on the field, and now on the white flag lap, it looks like the seven-time track champion is going to win the second annual Signe Molinar Memorial Race. This will be his third feature win of the season, and his 102nd Ileana career victory. He's fast and smooth, and more than anything, he wanted to win this very special event, honoring Ileana's first lady. Of course Luda wasn't out there. She was still in Siberia when that footage was taken. Maybe this year. But not today because we're out of time with only enough left to acknowledge the fine work of our award-winning production team, including Chuck Itzenthaler, Sue Cassanda, John Papke, and Tom McGrady. Special thanks to JBTV's Jerry Bryant. Music is created for us by Fireside Recording Studio in Westchester, Illinois, and by independent artist Roger Polly and Jerry Herbert. Of course, we have to take a moment to thank the stars of this edition of Motorsports Unlimited, Mary Beth Claypool, Liz Cozy, Luda Kay, and our host, Bill Wilt. Me, I'm Rodney Hood, wondering what the gesture of the Firestone guru says about Bill's driving ability. According to Bill, ah, uh, never mind. Thanks for watching. See you next week. This program made possible, in part, by support from ABC Auto Parts, located on Ashland Avenue at 138th Street in Blue Island, Illinois. This program made possible, in part, by support from J.C. Whitney & Company, located just off I-80 at the Utica exit in LaSalle, Illinois. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Jimmy's Red Hots, located on Grand Avenue and Pulaski Road in Chicago. This program made possible in part by support from Westbrook Auto Repair, located on Franklin Avenue and Dora Street in Franklin Park, Illinois. This program made possible in part by support from Bridgestone Firestone and your local Bridgestone Firestone tire retailers. The Motorsport Advancement Crusade is a nonprofit organization dedicated to the preservation and enhancement of motorsport. We are entirely funded by voluntary contributions. For more information, write motorsport. Oh, you can write the whole thing, Motorsport Advancement Crusade if you'd like. But mail gets to us just fine, addressed motorsport, P.O. Box 66242, Chicago, Illinois, 60666 or just call area code 773-478-4224. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to call or write. Next week at Chevy Vet Fest. It's the first Chevy Vet Fest of the year 2000 featuring beautiful cars like this. Race cars to all next week on Motorsport Unlimited. So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And uh, keep on rocking.